For this video, I played every Warriors Orochi game, along with a bonus Warriors crossover game. If you aren't in the loop, the Warriors games, or Musou in Japan, are a series of hack and slash games that started with Dynasty Warriors, originally created by Koei Tecmo and developed by Omega Force. These Warriors games I'll be taking a look at today take characters from various Koei games and throws them into an often bizarre crossover experience. Let's jump right into it! The first game we'll be taking a look at today is Warriors Orochi, released in 2007. Warriors Orochi features the characters of Dynasty Warriors 5 and Samurai Warriors 2 being brought together into the same universe by the mythical serpent Orochi. Every Orochi game heavily features mythological figures of China, Japan, and eventually even Greece. Warriors Orochi features 79 playable characters, 48 from Dynasty Warriors, 29 from Samurai Warriors, and 2 characters unique to Orochi games. The game opens with the heroes of Dynasty and Samurai Warriors being defeated by Orochi and scattered throughout a strange new land. The game splits into four separate story modes from there for each faction, the kingdoms of Wei, Wu, and Shu, and Samurai Warriors. In each of these story modes, the heroes reunite and resist Orochi with several former allies now working with Orochi. I randomly chose to play through Wei's story mode and was a little surprised by how much I enjoyed the story itself. Wei's story mode focuses on Cao Pi, who joined Orochi with the intention of eventually betraying the demon. I was surprised that, in a game with so many characters, Wei's story mode really only featured a handful of characters, with Cao Pi, Ishida Mitsunari, and Da Ji being the main cast. That approach definitely worked though, because I enjoyed the very strenuous dynamic between the three of them. Most notably with the side characters, this bizarre setting really helped bring some fun personality to characters in a time where the mainline games were relatively grounded and realistic. It was always fun to fight against Dong Zhuo, for instance, because you never knew what crazy dialogue you'd get from him next. Warriors Orochi is based on the Samurai Warriors 2 engine, so it's most similar to that game, though there are notable differences. You now use three characters instead of just one, which is a great feature in a game with so many characters. A lot of the Samurai Warriors 2 mechanics were removed from the game though that would have been useful, such as the bow, arrow deflection, rolling, parrying, and more. All enemies in Warriors Orochi, even the ones from Dynasty Warriors 5, behave like the Samurai Warriors 2 enemies which makes the game a bit more difficult thanks to Samurai Warriors 2's expanded enemy attacks. Unsurprisingly, my experience with this game was very similar to my time with Samurai Warriors 2. The peons were aggressive and the enemy officers hit very hard. Unlike some other Warriors games, it was very important in this game to advance with my allies as they were a big help in officer battles. My main issue with this game was the balancing. Throughout my entire playtime, I never quite felt like my characters were strong enough to comfortably play through normal difficulty. In the early stages, I felt like I wasn't doing enough damage. By the later stages, my damage output was good, but I had no health and could die in just a few hits. There were a few stages where I had to turn down the game to easy, like Shiako and Yamazaki, which isn't something I've ever done in a Warriors game. After consulting with a few veterans of the series in the r slash Dynasty Warriors Discord, link in the description, come check us out, the general consensus was that some stages were more balanced around playing them on easy for your first playthrough, just because your characters aren't leveled enough. And so that leads me into my next point, this game is very grindy if you want to use more than three characters throughout a story mode. To explain, let's take a look at character leveling. The two ways to increase a character's level is to get experience pickups from defeated enemies in battle, or use growth points to level them up outside of battle. Now in a game with 79 characters, I originally wanted to use multiple characters throughout the story mode to get a nice variety of gameplay. I figured the growth point system would be able to keep the few extra characters I like to occasionally use to a level comparable to my main characters. That was definitely not the case. At about the halfway point in Wei's story mode, I realized that unless I felt like grinding repeat battles, I needed to just pick three characters and stick with them. 
Even using those three for the majority of the story mode and dumping my growth points into them, I still was underleveled by the time I hit Wei's final battle on normal difficulty. The real problem with the game is that if you're supposed to play it on easy first while your characters are a low level, easy is just too easy. Easy is a breeze while you'll die in a few hits on normal. This unbalance in difficulty was frustrating in an otherwise great game. Warriors Orochi does feature somewhat of a solution to the grinding by including X battles. X battles are extra battles with the goal of unlocking new characters. These reduce the number of repeat battles you have to do to level up, at least if you stick to leveling up a small number of characters. Thankfully, in the later Orochi games, growth points are a little more generous which lets you use a lot more characters throughout the game with less grind. Speaking of characters, they're divided into three classes, power, technique, and speed. In my experience with this game, speed characters were pretty much useless, they have a couple cool abilities like an air dash, but they're ultimately too weak to be that useful. Power and technique were both much more effective. Technique characters got some additional abilities that can do heavy damage and get you out of a bad situation. Power characters are pretty similar and also get some hyper armor, so some attacks don't make them flinch. I don't know if this was actually a mechanic, but it seemed like power characters did the best breaking through enemy hyper armor as well. This is also more of a nitpick than anything, but this was especially noticeable in Wei's last battle. If this game has 79 unique characters, why aren't they being used? The final battle against Orochi felt so anticlimactic because the whole time I was fighting against and alongside generic officers. It would have been a lot more fun to be fighting alongside unique characters that I had helped or already fought in story mode. Hopefully the other story modes in the game are a little bit better in that aspect. Overall, Warriors Orochi is a great game with some balancing issues. I can't say I would play it over Dynasty Warriors 5 or Samurai Warriors 2, but it was a fun experience for being the first true Warriors crossover. It's worth checking out for fans of classic Warriors games, even though it will be overshadowed by some other games in the Orochi series. Warriors Orochi 2 released only one year later in 2008 and picks up right where the first game left off with the defeat of Orochi. Orochi 2 has 92 playable characters as it added 2 characters from Dynasty Warriors 3, 5 characters from Samurai Warriors 2 Extreme Legends, and 6 completely new characters exclusive to the Orochi series. With Orochi defeated, our heroes now have to hunt down the remnants of Orochi's forces as they attempt to revive the Serpent King. The four story modes return along with a new story mode called Orochi. This story is actually a prequel to the first game and lets you play with the likes of Orochi, Daji, and the rest of the evil characters. Warriors Orochi 2 has four game modes in total, story mode, dream mode, survival mode, and versus mode. I played through Shu's story mode this time around, and it centered around Liu Bei's hunt for Da Ji as she works to resurrect Orochi. Compared to Wei's story mode in the first game, I thought this story mode did a better job of including a wider array of characters in somewhat prominent roles. Dream mode kind of replaces the X battles from the previous game. Dream battles are standalone side stories you have to unlock where you're forced to play as a certain team of three characters. While I'm never a fan of being forced to use certain characters, this is a decent way to give the less important characters some spotlight. Survival mode turns the game into more of a fighter where you try to win as many matches as possible with your team. Versus mode is similar to challenge mode in other Warriors games, but unfortunately it is two player only. It would have been much better to give you the option to play these mini games against the AI like in other Warriors games. Now onto the gameplay. Warriors Orochi 2 fixes just about all the issues I had with the first game. For starters, balancing is done much better here. I was actually able to complete story mode entirely on normal rather than having to bump the difficulty down to easy. I was also able to spread my points out a lot more liberally, meaning I got to use more characters throughout story mode than in the first game. By the end though, it was still important that I had my three main characters leveled up to a decent level. 
Speaking of my main characters, forget what I said about classes in the first part of this video. After playing this game, I think I've realized that movesets matter way more than a character's actual class. My favorite character in this game ended up being Zhuo Si, a speed character, even though I just said speed was useless in the previous game. Ieyasu, a power character, was also a favorite of mine. I felt like I really couldn't use technique characters to their full potential for whatever reason. There's not much more to say about Orochi 2 really. It does exactly what a sequel is supposed to do. It improves on the original in pretty much every way and is without a doubt one of the best Warriors games of the PS2 era. I can't recommend it enough. Oh, one bad thing about the game though? The final battle with Orochi X is some BS. I died and had to replay the battle three times to finally beat him. Still a fantastic game though. I wanted to make sure that I mentioned Musou Orochi Z that only released in Japan, Taiwan, and Korea. Orochi Z combines Orochi 1 and 2 into one game in a sort of complete edition as it has other updates and changes. There is an English patch of the game floating around the internet that seems somewhat serviceable. If you can get your hands on it, it seems like that's the definitive way to play these two games. I wasn't able to locate it and try it myself though. Warriors Orochi 3 released in 2011 and serves as kind of a reboot for the Orochi series. The Ultimate Edition of Orochi 3 features a staggering 145 playable characters with several guest characters from other non-Warriors Koei Tecmo games. Unlike the previous two Orochi games, this game and any future Orochi games do not have English voice acting. Before we talk about the game, I want to go over all the different ports and versions of this game. You've got the original Warriors Orochi 3, Musou Orochi 2 Special, Warriors Orochi 3 Hyper, Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate, and the 2022 release Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate Definitive Edition. Five versions of one game has to be a record for Warriors titles. For this video, I'll be playing Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate, which features everything besides some included DLC in the Definitive Edition. Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate has Story Mode, Gauntlet Mode, and Shin Musou Battlefields. The base game doesn't have a Gauntlet Mode. Story Mode has been changed significantly from previous games. Instead of four or five different Story Modes for each faction, all of the story is wrapped into one massive story mode with plenty of side battles and even alternate versions of battles called Redux Battles. Redux? Redo? I don't know how that's pronounced. With just a single story mode, Orochi 3 involves everyone teaming up to take down Orochi and the new Hydra enemy. Ultimate also adds plenty of characters and post-game content not featured in the original Warriors Orochi 3. 3's storyline starts out somewhat similar to the first game. You start out playing as the last human survivors making a final stand against Orochi, and you pretty much lose. Before humanity is wiped out, the mystical being Kaguya steps in and rescues the last survivors. Kaguya has the power to time travel, and so the rest of the storyline is rewriting the timeline so that humanity comes out on top in the end. As I mentioned earlier, this game has 145 characters, so obviously not all of them are going to be able to get a spotlight. I do think though that 3 did probably as good as it could have incorporating everyone. There are plenty of characters that really only get a single battle to shine, but I think that's okay. If you really love certain characters, you're free to use them however often you want once you unlock them. It's not like previous Orochi games where you can only use certain characters depending on your faction. Now, does 3 fix one of my problems with the Rochi games in that you fight generic officers the whole time when there are literally now over 100 unique characters you can be fighting? Kinda. It's better than previous games, but you still fight so many generics. 3 is very generous with growth points. So long as you spend them somewhat wisely, you will always have enough points to use any characters at any point in the story. There is also a new character type called Wonder, which revolves around buffs and combos. 
Now, I didn't mention this at all in Orochi 1 or 2 because it isn't super noticeable, but in 3, there begins to be a clear divide between the effectiveness of Dynasty Warriors characters and Samurai Warriors characters. This is because Orochi 3 uses movesets from Dynasty Warriors 7 and Samurai Warriors 3. Dynasty Warriors 7 was a major overhaul for the series, and everyone got completely new movesets, while Samurai Warriors 3 is, for the most part, pretty similar to the previous two Samurai Warriors games. This means that in Orochi 3, Dynasty Warriors characters are just so much more powerful and fun to use as opposed to Samurai Warriors characters. That's not to say Samurai Warriors characters aren't fun to use though, because Omega Force clearly put a lot of thought and effort into this game as every character got new moves added to their moveset. Despite that though, the difference in power is obvious between these two groups of characters. Let's talk about side modes now. First we have Gauntlet Mode. I'll be honest, I did not understand Gauntlet Mode when I recorded footage for this video. I still don't really have the greatest grasp on it, even having spent more time with it. This side mode, at least to me, is surprisingly intricate and probably one of the most detailed side modes we've seen in a Warriors game. The basic gist of Gauntlet mode is you select 5 characters and fight through a series of kind of random battles that have all sorts of events and other things going on. It's structured like a dungeon though, so your goal is to escape each battlefield. Gauntlet mode features items that can't be obtained elsewhere throughout the game, and you can use anything you obtain here in the story mode, so it's a cool way to grind at least. Again, this is a super surface level look at this mode, there's just a ton going on. After that we have dual mode, it's a throwback to the Warrior series roots as a fighting game. There are some things to unlock in this mode as well, but I just really don't find these modes all that interesting in Warriors games. Finally we have Musou Battlefields. This is a mode that I am incredibly conflicted about. On one hand, it's something that I've wanted since I started playing Warriors games. The chance to create my own battles in a Warriors game is literally a dream come true. On the other hand, Musou Battlefields is so very limited that it feels like a tease more than anything. Let's break down what you can actually do here. You start by choosing a battle that you want to edit. In 3 Ultimate, you get the opportunity to change out every allied and enemy officer to another character of your choosing. Important to note that it was more limited in the original 3. You then can change the lines of dialogue that the characters say throughout the battle, including creating your own lines in 3 Ultimate. Essentially, you can create your own storyline through the battle, which is really cool. There are also other things you can change about the battle, including the troops for each side, music, sound effects, and more. It's not perfect, of course. When you change an officer out, their name doesn't actually change for whatever reason. Any changes you implement affect the entire battle rather than just a part of it. And of course, the battle's events and objectives cannot be changed whatsoever. It's kind of like a proof of concept more than anything. This is like the early stages of a Mario Maker type Warriors game. You could call it Musou Maker. I know it'll never happen as Warriors games, at least non-Nintendo ones, continue to get less and less popular over time, but I can always dream about a true Warriors game where you can really create your own battlefields. And at least I have this mode to show that at least a few other developers were thinking the same thing. So that's a quick look at Warriors Orochi 3 Ultimate. You really can feel Omega Force's heart and soul put into this game, which I can't say happens often with them. One of the best parts of Warriors Orochi 3 are the little details. The different conversations you can have with characters at your camp in between battles. The unique lines that you get if you take certain characters into a battle. And of course, characters getting replaced if you're playing as them, so you don't have two of the same character running around each battle. It is legitimately one of the best Warriors games ever made, and I recommend that everyone give it a shot. Just make sure that you play the Ultimate Edition, or the Ultimate Definitive Edition, or the Extreme Super Deluxe Ultimate Edition releasing in 2030. Okay, just kidding. Warriors All-Stars released in 2017 and was meant to be a celebration game for Omega Force's 20th anniversary. I think that's fitting, as this game sucks just like a lot of modern Omega Force games do. Before I tear this fever dream of a video game apart, let's get into what this game is about. 
Rather than making a typical Warriors Orochi game, Koei Tecmo wanted to try something different and highlight only the most popular characters across multiple franchises, rather than including the entire casts of Dynasty and Samurai Warriors. I also assume this change was made because it's a lot less time and effort than creating a Warriors Orochi 4, which they would do anyway after this game basically flopped. This meant that the playable characters dropped from 145 in Warriors Orochi 3 to only 30 characters. And what did they do to make up for that massive drop in playable characters? Absolutely nothing! In fact, they took away game modes like Free Mode where you actually might want to use those characters. Honestly though, the characters are the least of this game's problems. The new characters are actually one of the few bright spots. 24 characters in this game are from non-Warriors franchises, meaning their movesets were created solely for this game. As an example, it's honestly pretty fun using dead or alive characters in a Warriors game and seeing what their movesets are like. As I played through the game, I was kind of surprised that this even released in the West, since many of the franchises featured here have little to no popularity in the West or even release here. I'd call myself a pretty diehard Koei Tecmo fan, and I had never even heard of the franchises Ryo, Haruka, or Opuna. The plot of this game is pretty basic. Characters from different Koei Tecmo games got teleported to a different world to help save it from the apocalypse. The original characters for this game are all furries because the developers wanted to make them stand out from all the already established characters. It's not a big deal, but they end up having this really uncanny look in my opinion. Our heroes are split between three factions that are all fighting to become the furry ruler of this strange land. That means, despite there being technically seven or so campaigns to choose from, there are really only three story modes in this game. Before I get into the reasons why I dislike this game, let's be clear that this title was made purely for fan service purposes. That much is clear after playing a battle with Nao Tora or any of the half-dressed women in this game. There are also some hot spring scenes in this game, but nothing that pushes the game's T for Teen rating. I also have to mention the rush mechanic. This feature alone is what makes me call this game a fever dream. I never thought I'd play a game where Lu Bu and Wang Yuanji would be cheering me on as I murder countless numbers of furries with a rainbow border around my screen. Anyway, on to the bad of the game. The battles are awful. All Stars uses the base capture mechanic found in Dynasty and Samurai Warriors Empires games, where you capture bases by defeating a set amount of enemies and then defeating a base commander. Now, I really like this mechanic in Empires games, where you can strategically order your army around to capture and defend bases, but in this game where you can't order units around, it serves as nothing more than to pad out the battles, instead of developing actual interesting ones. The developers just threw these bases around the map to force you to spend way more time than you need to on each battle. I will give credit where it's due that at least there are a decent variety of enemies in this game taken from the different franchises, but when you're just fighting the basic generic furries, it gets really boring fast. Another way they pad out these dreadful battles is with the bravery system. In each battle, enemy officers will have a bravery level that you need to reach by defeating enemies and completing objectives to be able to effectively fight them. Thankfully, it's not too difficult to raise your bravery level, and you can fight enemies one or two levels above your bravery, but it's just another useless mechanic there to waste your time. There's also a card system that gives you buffs, and an affection system that does... something, but who cares? They add little to this already very shallow experience. Not to mention there are no other game modes besides story mode. Not even a free mode to use whatever characters you want in whatever battle you want. That's all I have to say about All Stars. The new characters are fun to use, but everything about this game just sucks. I only spent $10 on it, and I still feel like I got ripped off. Skip this one unless you're a super diehard Warriors fan. Warriors Orochi 4 is the last Orochi game to date, and possibly the last Orochi game we'll ever get. I'll touch on that more at the end. 4 released in 2018, and for this video, I'll be playing 4 Ultimate. 
4 Ultimate has 177 playable characters, which is a Guinness World Record. This includes characters from Dynasty Warriors 8, Samurai Warriors 4, a few returning guest characters, and the all-new Greek and Norse characters. Yes, Greek and Norse. For whatever reason, this game series focused on Chinese and Japanese mythology decided to incorporate Western gods. At least they have good character designs. Anyway, the story is that Zeus brought all of our heroes back together into a parallel world. Through betrayal and other events, the warriors end up banding together with the Greek gods to fight against Odin and the Norse gods with Orochi on their side. As evidenced by the really cool opening cutscene using footage from old Orochi games, all of the events in the previous Orochi games did actually happen. And as time progresses through 4, our heroes start to regain their memories of fighting alongside each other in past games. The story of 4 is just fine. The story mode is incredibly long though, which is where a lot of people have issues with this game. There's a lot of content, but the content overall isn't really that interesting. When discussing it with others, it's been described to me as what you see is what you get, and I do agree. The game does have some fun little features though, like cute little support dialogue between characters. I also really like the pre-battle screen in this game with your three characters standing together. I can't explain why, but it's really cool and unlike any other pre-battle screen. I should also mention that some characters like Lu Bu and Nobunaga got new forms they can transform into called deification forms, which is kind of cool. Now let's get into the gameplay. It's really good. Dynasty Warriors 8 and Samurai Warriors 4 have probably the best movesets that Omega Force has ever created, and almost every character is fun to use. Unlike last game though, now Samurai Warriors characters feel way more effective than Dynasty Warriors characters, because Samurai characters have access to hyper attacks. These hyper attacks just give them so much more mobility than Dynasty Warriors characters. Orochi 4 also introduced a new magic system. Magic attacks are 4 new attacks added to your moveset that vary by character type. Some enemies require you to defeat them using magic attacks too. I quite like the magic system. I think the attacks are fun to use, and it really doesn't overcomplicate anything. It is a little silly though, seeing warriors characters fly in the air and perform kamehamehas. One other thing to note about the characters is that it really sucks that for whatever reason this game decided not to include characters from Samurai Warriors Spirit of Sonata, because those movesets are awesome and should have been in this game. Before we move on to other game modes, I also want to mention a pretty important quality of life change that 4 Ultimate got over the base game. When selecting one of the 170 characters in the game, 4 Ultimate uses this very sleek and intuitive character select system from Orochi 3. The original 4 uses this awful list format that is a nightmare to navigate once you have a decent amount of characters. Just one of the many reasons to play Ultimate rather than the original. So the first side mode in 4 Ultimate is the Battle Arena. This mode was very ambitious because it's focused around playing with others online. If you don't have a lot of experience with Warriors games, that's ambitious because Warriors games don't have an active online multiplayer community at all. Online multiplayer in Warriors games is typically dead not even months after the game releases and it never is really all that active to begin with. Koei has to know this, so I have no idea why time was even put into a mode like this. Despite that, it is a cool mode that you can technically play with the AI. Battle Arena is a competitive mode where two teams fight against each other with the goal of capturing all the bases on the map on a really tiny battlefield. I watched some gameplay online of a full team of players against another team, and it looked fun. There's just definitely a lot of missed potential with there only being one battlefield and only a few bases. The next side mode is challenge mode. Within challenge mode, you have Havoc and Godspeed. Long story short, these minigames both aren't very fun. In Havoc, you destroy as many items around the map as fast as possible, and in Godspeed, you defeat 1000 enemies as fast as possible. They're both just really lazy minigames compared to what we've seen in other Warriors games. The last mode we have to take a look at is Infinity Mode. 
This mode is a tower mode similar to the ones found in early Samurai Warriors games. It's pretty simple. You complete different objectives depending on the battle, unlock characters to use, and climb the tower. It's nothing special and definitely less interesting than Gauntlet Mode in 3 Ultimate. And that's all there is to say about 4 Ultimate. It's a fun game, but it's a grind to get through, and there's really just not that much interesting stuff in it. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to take the time to actually finish it myself, but if you enjoy Modern Warriors games, this is a good one to play. Alright, now on to the tier list. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do this ranking portion of the video. Originally I did it unscripted, then I did it with no explanation at all in the Samurai Warriors video. So today I'm going to go for a middle ground. I'm doing it kind of scripted just so I can make sure to explain all of my rankings. So starting with Warriors Orochi. It's almost an amazing game. It's really close. but. What gets it in the good tier is its unbalanced difficulty and the need to grind if you want to use more than one group of three characters. And then by fixing its predecessor's problems, Orochi 2 definitely lands in the amazing tier. There are a couple things I like better about the first game, but overall 2 is much more balanced and therefore much more fun. Then, if you couldn't guess, Orochi 3 lands in the amazing tier as well. Now the difficult part for me is deciding if I like Orochi 2 or Orochi 3 more. Honestly, I have to give the edge to Orochi 3. The reason why is, if you watched my previous Warriors ranking videos, you'll see how much I dislike both Dynasty Warriors 7 and Samurai Warriors 3. Now despite the fact that Orochi 3 is based off these two games, it's still fantastic. It is without a doubt the best game to play if you want to use movesets and characters from either Dynasty Warriors 7 or Samurai Warriors 3. The fact that Omega Force manages that, along with better side modes than 2, means that I have to give Orochi 3 the top spot. Now this may be surprising considering my review of the game, but I struggled on where to put Warriors All-Stars. I don't know if I consider it the worst average Warriors game or the best bad Warriors game. Don't get me wrong, I could have easily thrown it in the bad tier and moved on, but I think the new characters are fun and interesting enough to where I don't really put the game among some of the worst that the Warriors franchise has to offer. I look at it as I'd rather play All-Stars than play Dynasty Warriors 6, for example. So I'll place it into the average tier here, but consider it a very, very low average. Finally, Warriors Orochi 4. It goes in the good tier solely based on how fun the characters are to use. It's important to note that while 4 is behind the original game, it is way, 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 way better than All-Stars. I think once I rank every Warriors game all in one tier list, that'll be conveyed a lot better. Now that we've got them all ranked, I mentioned earlier that the Orochi series may very well be finished. Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors have recently gone in completely different directions, and so a crossover between the two seems almost impossible. If this is truly the end of the Orochi series, it had a great run. It really brought out the best in Omega Force, and I can confidently say there was never a bad Orochi game. All Stars does not count as an Orochi game, by the way. So, thank you for watching the third episode of the I Play Every series. The support has meant so much to me, and I can't wait to bring you all more videos like my upcoming, extremely late Dynasty Warriors 9 Empires review. Also, the next I Play Every episode will still be a Koei Tecmo series, but not a Warriors game this time. We'll be playing and ranking every Romance of the Three Kingdoms game. So, I hope I see you there. Thanks for watching.